today we are fortunate to be witnessing you know not one but two of uh, those once in a generation kind of uh, revolution first is the computing revolution as you know we are moving away from the traditional PCs hardware uh, data centers into the cloud second is the e-commerce revolution that is happening right here right now in Southeast Asia my name is Surya Today I'm going to talk about how uh, the Redmart infrastructure has evolved um, as we live through this time. <coughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, living at these times when you know, uh, almost every day we see new technologies, new tools coming up. With each of these technology, you know, claiming to be performing certain things uh, more effectively, uh, simpler than the others. Um, how do we actually live through that? In this talk, we're going to talk about uh, how, um, what are the kind of uh, challenges that any organization have to face once they say, I want to do DevOps and I want to scale my engineering team. First off, uh, let's look at uh, how our infrastructure has changed from the time of uh, monolithic application um, architecture into the microservice architecture. Uh, just like any uh, e-commerce uh, startup, Redmart MVP was built on top of Magento. You know, the business grew and then uh, we saw customers are uh, taking up the value proposition offered by Redmart and based on the traction and uh, better understanding of uh, what it takes to run a successful online grocery business. Uh, we saw these huge potentials, uh, but those are problems that can only be solved when you have a strong tech team. So our first uh, version of API uh, was built to create Magento, uh, which was, by the way, a monolithic application. But by then, uh, the direction was set uh, that microservice architecture is the way to go. And since then, we never looked back. By the end of uh, 2015, we are close to 100% on microservices. And as of today, uh, we have hundreds of our services uh, running on our infrastructure. You know, the arrival of AWS actually brings in uh, new uh, computing era where uh, we are fortunate to be part of that early adopters. Um, now we started off with the classic EC2 models. Uh, that was, uh, you know, at the time when we have to uh, contend with the fact that you know, most of our servers are residing on the public domain and they are easily public, uh, publicly accessible. That was until the concept of VPC came about uh, when AWS introduced uh, the VPC and slowly we migrated. We, it didn't happen overnight. We migrated slowly, uh, you know, whatever is in the public space into the private space. And today we are nearly, you know, most of our servers are inside the VPC. <coughs> this is uh, how our tech stack looks like. It is uh, quite uh, heterogeneous. Uh, we are more inclined uh, towards uh, open source rather than commercial solutions. You know, we love uh, proven technologies, but we keep an open mind when it comes to uh, new and emerging uh, technologies. Uh, more importantly is that we believe that, you know, there are always multiple ways of looking and solving at a, a problem. What this means is that uh, we believe that you know, the one-size-fits-all approach to solving any problem is never, give us, uh, is never going to give us uh, the most optimal solutions to a problem. So on AWS side, we rely heavily on um, uh, EC2 instances, but we do use uh, some of their other services as well, like Kinesis, uh, Redis, uh, and even the latest serverless uh, Lambda function. And on the development front, we are uh, largely uh, Java and Scala shop. 
uh, we use both uh, SQL and NoSQL as the uh, persistent storage. And then we use uh, Redis as the in-memory in, in cache. You know, with, with such a diverse stack, uh, one of the first key challenges that you have to deal with is ask yourself, how do you actually uh, easily create a feature test environment so that you know, teams, uh, developers can actually collaborate across teams? So in, the, uh, in this diagram, we see a very typical scenario, pretty much uh, what we will uh, add you know, about a year back. So in this uh, diagram, we see that uh, there are multiple developers uh, working uh, on a, a common feature. That feature uh, happens to touch a uh, number of services. So uh, we, without, without the kind of uh, proper test environment, uh, set up for them, what happens is that you end up, uh, let's say this developer one, he could be you know, running a set of uh, services uh, on his own local machine. So whatever is there is mostly locally configured. And then developer two, the same thing, he might be running another set of services on his own local machines. And then in some cases, they might have access to certain servers that is provisioned for them. And what happens is that they might just run uh, any service on these machines uh, that can be running on any arbitrary ports. Um, and so what ends up happening is, you know, developers will uh, finish it and say it works on my machine, but what about the rest, right? So uh, what happens to the other teams, you know, like the QA and even the end user? Um, they will be asking, they will be confused. What exactly gets tested? When was it tested? How was it tested? You know, those are the kind of uh, questions, problems that uh, people will face. So what are the options we have? We basically have uh, two options. The first option is, uh, it's a bit dark here. So, uh, but essentially the first option is what I refer to as the brute force approach, where what we can do is take whatever test environment that we have and replicate it to create a new uh, feature test environment. But you know, that is, uh, first of all, it's gonna be costly and it's gonna take time because you have to replicate the entire environment over. What about the second options? The second options uh, require uh, a bit more creativity. Uh, what it means is uh, we can take whatever uh, test environment that we already have and then based on the requirement of that new features, we create a delta, and then that uh, sum up, they form a new test uh, environment. Uh, this is how uh, it looks like. By the way, we chose the second approach, and this is uh, how uh, our test setup looks like. You know, on the vertical axis, you have four layers. It started with the front end, where uh, this is typically the page that you see when you go to redmart.com. So uh, down one layer, there we have the public API gateway. So we use Nginx to power our API gateway. Uh, so what this API gateway does is to uh, take any incoming traffic and, it, and route it to the appropriate uh, backend services. And then uh, we have what we call our poor man's version of a service registry, which we are using uh, HA proxy. So what happens here is that every service is assigned a unique port um, to, on this service registry. And it's accessible from uh, all the other services through that unique port. What is more interesting is uh, our, uh, this is how the feature test environment looks like. So today, entire Redmart team, uh, they see that as if we have n number of feature test sites. But actually, we are only having one. The trick actually happens on the uh, API gateway layer, where we create uh, two separate routes, um, one that is for the alpha environment, uh, and the other one is for the feature routing. So this uh, feature routes is actually configured to be smart enough to determine if a particular request, uh, should it be routed to the feature instances or should it be routed to the uh, stable test instances. 
because remember that this is just a delta where you know only services that are required to be modified for that feature will be there you know all these things uh, uh, looks good but it is something that won't be manageable if you don't have a good uh, CI uh, CD uh, workflow you know as engineers uh, we are mostly lazy right but for a good reason what does it being lazy means it means that we always try to find the most effective way of doing certain things right so what does the developer uh, have to do when they want to create a feature branch they only need to do two steps uh, first is you know they they just need to create a feature branch on their repository and then push it uh, to github so what happens when uh, they, they push this feature branch is it will trigger a build process and uh, at the end of this build process uh, we will determine um, if this is a feature uh, branch it is supposed to go into the right feature bucket okay once this whole uh, pipeline is completed uh, the second step is for them to go into our chat ops um, and issue a command to say that I want a new feature environment for this service uh, with this feature name. So under the hood, what is happening is that there is a bot that is running behind. So what the bot does is uh, to first create the EC2 instance and then configure this instance to be running uh, a particular service. And it pulls the right artifacts from that feature location and uh, it gets deployed. And then after that is completed, the next step will be to configure the routing itself, which is the uh, API gateway level and then the internal service, uh, internal service registry level. What comes out of this whole command is a fully functional uh, test site that everybody can start using. You know, and all these things are actually not possible without uh, the help of uh, good release uh, engineering pipeline and also uh, we have built uh, quite you know significant amount of automation around uh, chat ops one of them obviously is the creation of uh, this feature instance and then we do have other uh, cool features coming up as well one of them is actually uh, to create a new service from scratch all the way until you know they get the instance ready our uh, release engineering pipeline has actually come a long way since we first uh, started. Uh, we started uh, with the Gitflow model, where we basically keep uh, one master branch that gets deployed to the production environment. And then we, uh, we have a developed branch uh, that gets deployed to the alpha environment or the test environment. And then we have many feature branches that gets deployed to nowhere. That was the past. And then late last year, you know, we started to uh, move into GitHub Flow with uh, proper semantic versioning. So what we did is we get rid of the uh, developed branch altogether. So we only have a single master branch. Uh, codes that are sitting in the master branch actually gets deployed to both uh, alpha and production environment but by default if a code is pushed into master branch it only gets deployed to the alpha environment not the production so if you want to trigger uh, deployment into production uh, there is a script that helps you do that so you just trigger that script what the script and specify whether you want to have uh, you know as with semantic versioning there is a major minor and patch version you specify uh, which version bump you want to do. So the version manager uh, will you know, determine, uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, the script will actually uh, uh, create an empty commit uh, with uh, you know, attached preformatted uh, commands. So what the commands uh, contain is basically the version bump that you specify when you execute that script. And then uh, at the end of the 
uh, script, it will see, okay, this is a production release. If it is a production release, I should trigger a, a release tag and then deploy it into production. Okay, this, this diagram actually makes it more clear what happens actually below. So uh, the first step is for developers to commit that code. And once that is done, you know, the, the, the build process will start. Uh, in Travis, we'll download the code and then compile it um, and then try to resolve all uh, dependencies uh, from the Nexus uh, repository that we have. And then uh, uh, all the various tasks uh, will be executed. And then uh, we have the code coverage analysis. Uh, the results will be published into the SonarCube dashboard. The last part is where the version manager comes in. So as you can see, there's a major minor version patch. So the version manager will determine, is this uh, supposed to be a production release? If it is a production release, it will uh, return a release tag into GitHub. And then uh, it will do the uh, necessary bump here, whether it's X, Y, Z. And then uh, it will actually push the artifacts into the right location. So we have three buckets, one production, alpha, and a feature. Um, and then it will determine which environment it should be deploying to. That's exactly uh, what's happening. So, um, you know, by the time you have this, you know, uh, you are pretty much uh, ready uh, to scale your team, right? Um, developers by now will be happy because they will be able to push their code anytime to the feature branch and they know that it's getting deployed somewhere and they don't have to worry that they will break something and have someone you know, screaming at them saying something is broken, right? Uh, the creation of microservices will probably accelerate, okay? By that time, you, the next set of challenges will be there waiting for you. With you know, uh, so many um, microservices running, uh, you know, one of the key issue is how do you monitor your logs? How do you monitor the? F how do you make each service you know uh, visible? You know, anytime you want to see uh, the state of a particular service, how do you do that? And most importantly, is like for a certain business transaction, how do you actually uh, trace it? Because uh, you know, instead of looking at a single stream of log, developers now will have to look at uh, multiple of streams of log that is coming from multiple servers, right? So how do you make sure that uh, you know, it is easily uh, traceable? Before you realize it, you, know, you have to deal with this huge mass of tangled services. And by now, you know, when uh, your developer are facing issues, uh, you know, that if euphoria start to come down, um, because they will start seeing all these uh, black screen, um, multiple windows. So what you need is a centralized uh, logging. Uh, there are some companies actually that offers uh, log management as a SaaS, uh, but choosing the log stack itself is just one part of the challenge. Right? The other part of the challenge, which is, I would say, is equally important is how do you standardize logs across different services? You know, when you have so many people working without uh, proper standardization, everybody will be logging at their own way. And right, this is where uh, Daniel later will be presenting the microservice template came in. It is, uh, you know, a close collaboration with that. Uh, and then it allows us to achieve what we have uh, here. So for the technology choice, we actually choose the ELK stack, uh, if you guys know, or if you haven't heard of it, it stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. So if you go to the literature and start searching, this is actually the recommended architecture for ELK. So we have the source that is coming from the application itself, and then we have the log agent uh, that monitors you know, the output of the log itself. right? And then uh, it usually uh, send this to a parser because the logs are usually in a raw format. 
it has to be parsed before they can, break, they can be properly indexed and then stored in the elastic search. And we use Kibana for the visualization. Uh, what most people will recommend is uh, having this cache uh, in between. Uh, but we didn't see this architecture as you know, a silver bullet to all logging problems. And we did certain experiments. And uh, this is the architecture we came up with. Of course, uh, if you can see from this diagram, the main thing is we get rid of the cache layer. Um, but to be able to do that and make sure that the stack is still reliable and scalable, we did quite uh, a few things. Uh, there were two important things there. First is that we look at the team structure, you know, and then we decided to create the cluster based on the team structure itself. So different teams, uh, they have different scaling needs that allows us to scale the log cluster based on their needs. <coughs> Second is, uh, you know, instead of sending it in a raw format, uh, we send it in a JSON format. So raw format, what I'm referring to is usually the lines where it's separated by tab. Uh, what that, uh, these two combination does is uh, there are at least four advantages that we get. Um, the first advantage is, uh, you know, uh, with that JSON log format, we can reduce the computation uh, required in the parser. So it does not have to parse uh, heavily. Uh, which means that we can run a less powerful instance for the log parser. Second is it gives uh, flexibility to the developers. It means that anytime they feel like they want to add certain fields into the log, they can do that without you know, requiring, requiring any changes on the parser side. And the third thing is the multi-line events, uh, which is especially important if you want to see your stack trace, printout, and all that. Of course, there's a plugin available for that, but uh, we found it to be quite uh, unstable. Uh, but all these multi-line events is taken care of when you look uh, use the JSON parser. And uh, last but not least is of course you know the cost factor. You know we are able to run this whole stack at a fraction of the cost of what would have cost if we go with the recommended uh, architecture model. Okay, ELK is good for application logging, right? But what about uh, time series metrics? Uh, we tried a couple of uh, options. You know, uh, there are a lot of uh, sexy time, sem time series uh, DB solutions and all that. Uh, but after evaluation, we decided to go back to the uh, proven stack, rather, uh, because we found that some of those tools are uh, good for you know startup to develop you know, POC and all that. But once you say you want to deploy it into a full-scale production mode, uh, they might not be uh, ready yet. So this is our uh, metrics collection stack. Similarly, you know, uh, we borrowed the concept of team clustering uh, for this. And then we have a statsd collector for each cluster. And then at the back end, we actually uh, scale it uh, according to the team as well. Uh, one of the key benefits that we get out of this is uh, immediately we get to plug uh, whatever Kbot uh, monitoring that we have directly into Grafana. And then we get to monitor all these metrics immediately. And the second thing is uh, we, it, it paves the way for us to go into the next uh, phase of uh, release engineering, which is the canary releases. Okay, so, so far so good, but uh, what about uh, service discovery? If you have a new service, new instance, how do you actually make sure that it's uh, discoverable? So uh, we did also try out a few alternatives for the service discovery, and we choose console over all the other options. Um, but this is how our uh, service discovery looks like uh, before uh, we, we roll out our uh, console service cluster. So here, Chef is actually the one where it keeps uh, track of the service and all the servers that is running, that is configured to run that service. And then uh, we have the HA proxy that checks uh, sh uh, from Chef directory itself, and it generates the uh, config based on the 
uh, data that is available in Chef. So this is the process that is going on if you try to first create a new service. First is you need to update Chef to tell the Chef that uh, you know I'm running this service and then which instance it's running on. And then after that, you have to do the next step, which is to update HA proxy. And then you have the, uh, the problem of horizontal scaling. If, let's say, certain services requires more capacity, you have to do two steps to bootstrap the EC2 instance and then to update the HA proxy after that. So this is what our console cluster looks like. So basically, we have uh, three nodes that is acting as the uh, master, which basically manage the cl uh, cluster management and all that. Um, and then we have the console agent running on all the servers. Uh, so what you see here is that the console agent gets to check the application, the health of the application itself. And then the application itself, uh, it is able to check with console if I want to talk to another uh, service, uh, where shall I go to? So the console agent that's running locally will be able to give that information. You know, so earlier I didn't, I didn't really explain why we chose console, but based on the, what we have achieved in the completion of phase one, uh, you know, we get at least three additional things out of this. Uh, first, of course, is you know, the service discovery itself. When you create a new service, it's immediately discoverable. Second is uh, you get um, to do more granular and customizable health check. Previously, we only have two health status, which is passing and critical. By the time it hits critical, maybe everything is too late. So we have right now the warning state where we can monitor not only the service endpoint, but then also the system level indicators like CPU, disk, uh, and memory utilization. And then um, any instance that fails the health check will get removed from the cluster immediately. The other thing that we get from here is the key value store. Uh, imagine you have hundreds of machines and uh, they are sharing a common config, right? How do you make sure that if you change a config, it gets propagated to all the servers without you doing anything, right? This is the thing that you get with the console key value. You can actually uh, set each agent to monitor a certain key, and if that key is updated, it, it will immediately, you know, you can update your environment variable or application config and all that. What is next left for us is uh, to figure out the inter-process communications, which is going to be helpful when we do auto-scaling and all that as well. So uh, this is the few things that are coming up in our pipeline. So even though we have uh, come so far, but yet, uh, I mean, there's still a lot of exciting things coming up. Uh, like uh, I said, you know, the serverless in, uh, Lambda function, the IAM consolidation, basically how do we secure uh, resources, uh, you know, and allows onboarding and offboarding people uh, in a very effective manner. And then, uh, like I said, you know, chat ops is one uh, of the big initiative as well. We are adding a lot of uh, capability around that. And then we are going to going into the chaos engineering. Instead of being uh, passive and reactive to failures, we want to be react, uh, proactive uh, in anticipating failures. And uh, yeah, canary releases, you know, instead of uh, doing one shot, uh, updating all the production instances, can we have uh, you know, a certain instances updated, direct certain tr uh, amount of traffic into the new version. Once we have a certain confidence level, then we will start routing to 100% of the traffic to the new version. Otherwise, we'll fall back. So yeah, those are some of the things. OK, with that, uh, yeah, thank you. Do we have time for? Do we have time for Q and A or maybe you can continue first? We'll do the Q and A.